All right, well, let's get started then. Sorry for the delay. I'm getting faster with setting up all of my stuff, but I'm trying to make this as efficient as possible, so I appreciate your patience. Can you guys hear me in the back okay? Good? Cool. Zoom, you can hear me all right, I assume. I see my microphone button moving, so should be all right. All right, I see a thumbs up. Okay, cool. So today we're going to finish off the lecture on non-invasive neuroimaging. I'm going to end up on EEG, and then I'm going to do a little bit of live coding. Uh, I don't believe the Jupyter Hub environment is up yet, so I'm going to have to push back the assignment release date. But there are still some things that I want to cover, just showing you guys how the interface works, so you can you know remember it forever, or just go back and look at the podcast or the recorded Zoom afterwards. Um, by the way, I don't know if the Zooms are auto uploading to Canvas, but are they? Do, do you know? They are? Okay, cool. And they're also on podcast. And the podcast quality is a little better because the microphone that I'm wearing here for podcast is better than my microphone for my laptop. So I recommend those. And I'm also uploading the, the videos to YouTube in case anybody wants to use YouTube and stuff. But okay. Uh, so let's finish off with the more popular non-invasive techniques. I mentioned fMRI a bunch of times yesterday or Wednesday, but fMRI is one of the more popular non-invasive neuroimaging modalities. It's really, really popular for looking at what regions of the brain are activated during certain tasks. So if we remember our, I'm sure I have it in here somewhere, if you remember our trade-off between spatial resolution on the y-axis and temporal resolution on the x-axis. We can see that fMRI is right here. Pretty poor temporal resolution. We're in the sort of hundreds of seconds, so in the minute range. But its spatial resolution is, is considerably better than EEG. And that's because of the way that fMRI works. So as you can see from this GIF here, it is producing images of different slices of the brain. So what we're seeing here is a new slice being added on the, the z-axis. And the reason it's able to do that is because of a series of magnets, essentially. So there's three different dimensional axes uh, for magnets in fMRI. And they're using that in order to target these very specific slices of the brain. The resolution that we have with fMRI is about, so one voxel, as they call it, is about three millimeters by three millimeters by three millimeters, something like this. So it's Pretty small, pretty good accuracy. But the problem with fMRI is that it's not directly measuring neuronal activity. Um, so instead of measuring the electricity like we would get from ECOGS or an MEA or even EEG, um, what we're measuring is the actual uh, metabolic change in the brain. So we're measuring blood flow as it goes to different regions of the brain. And more specifically, we're measuring the bold response, which is the blood oxygen level dependent signal uh, or response. And the reason it's, so it's interesting because it's actually measuring the deoxygenated blood, not the oxygenated blood. And there's, this is because of some really particular properties with deoxyhemoglobin, which I'm not familiar with the exact mechanics. Um, but essentially, when your blood is just moving around through your brain, all of the, the free hydrogen atoms, I think, are the main things that are being imaged, are sort of just in random spins, right? If you just seed a random distribution of spins, everything is moving in whatever way direction. When the magnet turns on, it makes it so that all of the, the hydrogen atoms are pointing in the same direction which allows you to have enough contrast with the other matter in order to image the stuff in that location. This is a very hand-wavy explanation. I'm not an fMRI researcher, but that's roughly the, the biophysics of how fMRI works. And for anyone who's been in, F in an fMRI, you recognize this room, or even if you've just seen it, you essentially have to be put into this little table that slides into this giant magnet, and you have to stay really, really, really still, because if you move, it can mess up the recordings. And it's pr I've done a lot of fMRIs, and it's really, really loud in there. Um, the, you can just sort of hear the thumping of the magnet the whole time, like, do, 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 do. It's, it's pretty intense. 
Um, and those sessions can be really long. I think I had a five-hour session once, and it was horrible. Um, but it's a really interesting experience. And participate in fMRI studies. Um, but yeah, so traditional fMRI is in this region right here, where we have at the roughly minute level resolution. The fastest you're going to get is in traditional fMRI is maybe like one second per scan. So that's really, really low sampling rates. If you compare that to you know, something like EEG or MEG, that's forever. But there is a, uh, a new method being developed right now, which is a, uh, a, a more rapid form of fMRI. So this, they call it DIANA, and it's an acronym for direct imaging of neuronal activity. Um, and they, I guess they cut out the at high temporal spatial resolution because it doesn't work with the acronym. But, uh, you know, right now we're seeing this. So this is an fMRI recording, and we're not looking at things in, you know, this isn't 150 seconds. This is milliseconds. So this is about as quickly as you would, you know, if I saw this and I, you didn't tell me it was fMRI, I would think this is some sort of EEG or MEG or ECOGS plot, not fMRI. Uh, so this is being, this is groundbreaking work. This is pretty new. And we'll see if it ends up getting to the human level because I believe the magnets are stronger than we currently use on humans. Um, I don't know, Srini sent me this paper in the lab a while ago, so maybe he has more information that he can pop in chat. But just to, to show you guys that there are developments that are trying to get fMRI uh, away from this very high spatial resolution but low temporal resolution down to something closer to that lower left-hand corner. So this is roughly where the Diana method sits. So it's about as fast as EEG, and it has better spatial resolution. This doesn't automatically mean that it's a better modality because uh, fMRI has its, its downsides, right? It's not very portable, as you can imagine. This giant set of magnets and tubes, they're incredibly expensive. They need to be in a magnetically shielded room. If you have even the smallest metal object in a strong magnet, it'll just get flung right into the fMRI machine. And if you've ever taken an fMRI safety course or training, you've heard horror stories of that happening, like experimenters forgetting to turn off the coils and walking with their laptops and then just <laughs> laptop going straight in, or even certain cases where people get pinned in because an oxygen tank gets rolled in and it just like pins a person into the machine. It's, so there are some serious dangers. It also is expensive to operate because it's cooled with liquid helium, which is insanely expensive. Um, and yeah. Also, Shrini says that he'll share, uh, share some more about that paper on Piazza, so look out for that. So yeah, even though fMRI can get better temporal resolution, it has pretty good spatial resolution, it's all about what you need it for, right? So if you're trying to make a BCI that somebody can use all the time or in their house or even in the hospital, you're not really going to develop that system with fMRI because even if they're in a hospital, fMRI time is incredibly expensive and people are going to use it for uh, increasingly important tasks and somebody just having it as their personal interface is not really feasible. Another one that is not super portable is MEG. So MEG also uses liquid helium to, uh, to cool it. So it's this giant tube. But rather than fMRI being something you sort of slide into supine, you're just sitting down on a chair. It's a pretty funny looking chair. And I, honestly, I just think this looks hilarious. I don't know why. Just like you have this giant, just giant hat. Um, but MEG measures something very similar to EEG, which we'll talk about later. Whenever you get these postsynaptic potentials, which I'll discuss, you produce an electrical potential, but also the conductance around, you know, if you look at the, the plane perpendicular to the flow of the electricity, you get the magnetic field, right? So you're always going to have a magnetic field when you have any sort of current going through any conductive surface. And those small magnetic fields that are being generated from the electricity going down, the dendrites, axons, whatever, are something that you can pick up with MEG. So the signal that EEG and MEG are picking up are essentially two different sides of the same coin. It's the same activity, but they're being measured completely differently. Um, and because of that, the, the practical differences between EEG and MEG are, there, there are several. Um, 
<laughs> this is a funny, uh, I'm not going to read that comment out loud, but those in, in Zoom chat can enjoy a nice, a nice analogy. Um, but yeah, so MEG, again, something that is not invasive. It's still expensive to, to operate because of the liquid helium. This needs an incredibly shielded room. Uh, because these magnets are so sensitive and they're picking up tiny, tiny magnetic fields, you need a very, very magnetically shielded room, something that's like 50,000 times... Like, the signals you're recording are 50,000 times smaller than the Earth's magnetic field. So if you were just recording this walking around or something, you would see nothing but the Earth's magnetic field. Um, however, there are some researchers that are developing uh, a portable MEG. And I really think they look like the Orakai. Like, every time I see this picture, I just think of this. Um, but essentially what they've done is they've made these room temperature... Uh, they're, they're not the same technology. It's not exactly the same, but they're these quantum sensors. I, I, I don't know. This is, this, no one's doing this research except for this lab. So it's not really relevant, but they're, they're making progress on it. But you do this 3D printed and molded mask that fits over a subject's head, and you place these little room temperature sensors, and you can record MEG. Um, there's a little video on this. I, I will play it out as well because I like videos. And it zoom people. So at the moment, if we want to... Give me a thumbs up if you can hear this zoom. Measure what the brain's doing, if we want to measure brain function. There are a few ways of doing it, but one way is magnetoencephalography, or, or MEG. I hate that he says MEG. Um, everybody I know says MEG, just like you would say EEG. No one calls EEG EEG. Um, some people do it for fun, but anyway, so just a pet peeve of mine. I don't like MEG. The idea of MEG is that we measure magnetic fields that exist outside the head that are generated by current flow in the brain. And in that way, we can work out what the brain was doing at any one time. The problem with current MEG scanners um, is that they're very large, they're very bulky, and they're one size fits all. The gap in the market, if that's the right expression, is for a scanner where, which you can wear on your head. So you put it on like a helmet, you can wear it on your head whilst we're acquiring brain imaging data. So to build a wearable imaging system, uh, you really need two things. You need very, very sensitive magnetic field sensors that are small, lightweight, and that can go on the head, and that's what we had with the quantum sensors. And then you need a way to house them on the head. And so to do that, we built a 3D printed head cast um, that would house the quantum sensors close to the scalp, uh, and that was designed based on a single subject's head shape. I volunteered to be that subject, and yeah, that's a bad job at explaining this, but this is the lead author. They, they never say that in the video. They should have. So she didn't just like volunteer to be the subject. She's yeah. <laughs> she's she's a, a legitimate scientist as well. They don't they don't say that anywhere in this video. It's hilarious. All right, well, whoops. Let's see if YouTube remembered where we were. Scalp. So this helmet accommodates 13 sensors which are over the motor region, the right motor region of my brain and putting it all together. Um, it just fits. Is it comfortable? Yeah, so it fits perfectly in my head. The quantum sensors give us the magnetic fields that are produced by our brain at any one time. And by knowing also the location of these sensors with respect to the brain, we can localize which area of the brain was responsible for the movement and also when that part of the brain was uh, engaged in that, in that certain task. Ideally, we would be looking at something more generic, like something like a bike helmet, which could be adaptable to any, anyone's head size uh, and could just hold 
um, the sensors without having to build something specifically for, for just one person. There are a number of challenges, but probably the biggest one we had was uh, reducing the Earth's magnetic field. So if you want somebody to be able to move with a scanner on their head, and that scanner's measuring magnetic fields, you need to somehow remove the Earth's magnetic field. So when they told me on day one that my job was going to be to remove the Earth's magnetic field, that sounded more like a joke they tell to new starters than anything else. The way we went about this was to build these new electromagnetic coils that um, produce fields that are equal and opposite to the Earth's magnetic field. So the mathematics required to design these coils to reduce the magnetic field is actually quite, um, quite complex, it's quite a large challenge, but then once you've got past all of that, the actual making of the coils is bits of wood, bits of masking tape, bits of glue and bits of wire, so it's a massive contrast really in what, you, what you're doing. They're um, housed on two planes, either side of the subject, so you've got one going down here, one going down here. And that keeps the scanner quite open, you can walk in and out of it. Crucially, it meant that the sensors wouldn't fail if the subject moved, even by a tiny amount. And that meant that um, any information we were getting from the sensors we knew was coming from the brain and that we would be able to do these cool experiments. With this new technology, um, scanning babies, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds um, is going to become possible. So that brings into play um, a number of different disorders like epilepsy, but also um, things like autism. I think um, we'll, we'll suddenly be able to, to really start seeing the neural substrates that underlie these, these disorders in children. A very interesting technology, yeah, question. Good question. So the question was, why would somebody want to use MEG over EEG? Um, one of the things that MEG has is a slightly better spatial resolution than EEG. So if you're trying to do some sort of source localization, you technically get a little bit better depth in theory with MEG over EEG. But for if you're trying to create something that is low cost, portable, doesn't need a magnetically shielded room, you would use EEG instead. Um, but yeah, a lot of the same artifacts that you get from EEG, you get in MEG as well. So it's not like you get additional trade-offs. Um, but an interesting thing would be in the future to have headsets that have sort of a hybrid MEG and EEG, um, where you could get, you know, you could get that really fast, maybe even faster response from digitizing EEG while still getting some sort of slower but still fast response sampling deeper in the brain with MEG, and you can do studies like that. There are people who do um, EEG, MEG studies at the same time with the traditional ones, where you'll put an EEG cap on, then put your head inside of this thing. Uh, I think there's a little bit of interference, but it's not, it's not too bad. You can, make, you can make electrodes that are capable of being in MEGs and not have too much of a problem. Yeah, question. So that's sort of what the researchers are alluding to in this. Uh, the question was, are there smaller headsets that are built for infant studies and stuff? Uh, if, you're tr if you're thinking about the traditional MEG, so this, uh, the big one, it's pretty hard. You can imagine it'd be pretty difficult to get a child to stay still in that, even if you could rise, you know, raise them up that high. With these headsets, because they're designed specifically to match an individual's face, you could theoretically build them to fit anybody's face. Whether the electrodes are, you know, the profile of the, of the, I guess they're quantrodes, I don't know. I don't know what they call them. If the sensors are made sufficiently small to get the same resolution, then you can imagine you're not going to lose any information. Um, but I don't think they've recorded from anybody except for the members within their lab, even. I think this is very much, uh, you know, this is pretty cutting edge stuff. So they're not at the stage where they're, I don't think, where they're researching <laughs> infants yet. Uh, but that's the possibility. And the reason why the magnetically shielded, you know, these magnetic coils are interesting is because it allows you to have people who are moving without having the Earth's magnetic fields take over in those, in those brief moments. And I should also clarify, because it's not clarified in this video, yes, that dude, you know, they built that, those coils with plywood and copper wire and tape and stuff, but they're still in a magnetically shielded room. Like, they're in a giant magnetically shielded room, and then they have these sub-coils also canceling out 
additional uh, artifacts. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, so Abhinav asks, isn't MEG about the same resolution as EEG? They're about the same. I think there are practical limitations to sampling MEG like as quickly as you could theoretically sample EEG. Um, but it would be about the same. In, in my opinion, so I'm not an MEG researcher, but from, from everything I've seen, because I've considered, you know, there's people who are like, oh, I have MEG data, or I have an MEG setup if you want to play around with it. And every time I look into why would I use MEG, I can't think of a good reason. Um, EEG is cheaper. It's you're not. It's not going to be slower than MEG. That's for sure. Um, it has the same artifacts, so it's not like you're getting a free lunch from switching to this other modality. And it's yeah. I don't know. So I don't. I don't really know why you would use MEG over EEG, like for BCI research. But for neuroimaging research, there seem to be some <laughs> advantages. <laughs> But yeah, in terms of resolution, they're about the same. I just think that there are, I think there are practical limitations that make MEG harder to sample as quickly. Like, you know, with EEG, you could easily get a thousand, uh, a thousand kilohertz sampling rate, no problem. It's just going to take a lot of memory. But I think that there are, because of the, um, yeah, I can't remember why I think this, but I think I remember reading something that you can, you're limited slightly more with MEG. But if somebody finds a source on that, then please let me know. So another non-invasive, and now we're moving more towards something that looks like EEG, is FNIRS. So this is functional near-infrared spectroscopy. And what we have on this, this cap, which looks similar to an EEG cap, is these optrodes, or optodes, but I like optrodes better. And essentially these are pairs where you'll have some sensor that is trying to pick up light, right, as it, as it sounds, optrodes. And specifically, that wavelength is going to be near infrared, as near infrared spectroscopy suggests. And then you have an emitter. So you have a receiver and emitter. The emitter puts out these near infrared light waves. They bounce off of different parts of tissue. And in this case, they're actually measuring metabolic signals, just like fMRI. From what I've read, FNIRS is not only measuring deoxygenated hemoglobin, but just hemoglobin in general. So it's not necessarily measuring the bold, the same bold response as we're getting in fMRI. Um, but yeah, so when the, the near-infrared light bounces off of blood, essentially, it comes back and it's scattered. There's properties that have been changed because of what it's hit, depending on how deep it goes, depending on how much blood there is. And when it bounces back, the different sensors pick that up and they can determine, okay, this signal we think came from this part of the brain. This is the time course of the signal we've gotten. It's an interesting technology. Also very cheap relative to something like fMRI or MEG. A little more expensive than EEG. Um, but it's fully portable, so you can have these sensors on caps. And you can even have, there are many companies that produce these caps that have both FNIRs and EEG electrodes on them. So you can sort of get the best of both worlds. FNIRS isn't particularly fast traditionally. There are people working on, so if we see, sorry, did I? My FNIRS is deleted. FNIRS is right here. Um, so it's roughly over here. It's, it's, a, it's slower than EEG, about the same speed as fMRI. Uh, and it is slightly better spatial resolution than EEG. It just has more depth penetration. But there is a company and a few people working on this new technology called Time Domain FNIRS, which, uh, yeah, this company, Kernel, has anyone heard of Kernel before? Raise of hands. Relatively small, okay. Relatively small company in LA, but an interesting one. And they're developing this, this Time Domain FNIRS technology and making their own headsets that have FNIRS and EEG. And we'll see if they do some cool stuff with it. But yeah, so Time Domain FNIRS, the algorithm that they propose, I actually read through one of their papers, and it's, they kind of make a lot of things opaque because I think they're trying to protect their, their methods or something. But from what I get from the paper, essentially they, they use the fact that um, certain waves diffract in certain ways, that you can, you're able to get better time by sampling in this weird way. I don't know. It's, very, it's a very hand-wavy paper. But... Uh, it moves, it moves the needle for FNIRS a little closer to the temporal resolution of EEG, 
while still getting better spatial resolution. So this is a technology that I think is very promising going on into the, the near future because we might get EEG speeds and better spatial resolution. So it's sort of a win-win. And they're relatively cheap to produce and, again, uh, portable. All right, so now I move to the fun stuff, EEG, and I will keep this pretty, sh well, I'll keep it as short as I can. Um, we'll talk about EEG throughout the entire course from now on. So everything else has been, is on hold now. Now it's all EEG. Uh, so this is, has, okay, show of hands, who's participated in an EEG study before? Okay, yeah, of course. Okay, not that many of you. Sign up on SONA for EEG studies. Um, Essentially, this is a traditional EEG cap, and all these little plastic things on it are electrodes. So each of these is picking up some sort of electrical activity from the scalp, and I've called this a cap a bunch of times, but this is the cap. Typically, this is a mesh material. It's like a swim cap, and the goal is for it to be somewhat breathable, but also stable enough that the electrodes aren't moving around all the time. Um, what we, this is the basic overview of what we're doing with EEG. I'm going to start on the right first. So as you can see, all of these caps are in these what look to be pretty arbitrary locations, but we actually have standardized electrode positions. So this is called the International 1020 system, and it's called that because uh, essentially I know that, I know that the 20 means that the electrode positions are 20 degrees apart. I can't remember what the first 10 means, but I know this, the 20 means that if you go from CZ and you go towards C4, you have moved 20 degrees along the head. Um, and so the names have a purpose. This right up here is the, you know, FPZ is sort of the prefrontal. We have the frontal, central, parietal, occipital. And the Z also has its thing, so it's a German for Zentrum, which is just center. So CZ is the, you know, central, central. It's the middle, it's the vertex. And everything on the left-hand side is going to be an odd number, and everything on the right-hand side is going to be an even number. And this is a system that pretty much all EEG researchers know and record from. So if you're reading a paper and you're like, oh, which electrode was that recorded from? And you see that it was recorded from FZ or FPZ or PZ or whatever. Everybody knows where that is on the head. Um, and so it's our way of standardizing essentially where we place our electrodes so that we can do replicable science. And there are other systems, but the International 1020 is the most popular by a massive margin. And then this is just an overview of sort of how collecting works, right? So we have our electrode that we're recording from. In this case, it's marked as an active electrode. Um, we're just going to pretend the word active isn't there. Let's just say this is the electrode. We have a ground electrode in order to make sure our participant is grounded. And then we have a reference electrode. And the reason why we have a reference is because whenever we're measuring voltage, we're measuring a difference, right? Uh, you, you, can't have, you can't measure voltage at a single point. It has to be referenced to something else. So you have the electrode you're recording from, and you have a reference electrode that that measurement is being referred to. Um, the choice of reference electrode is not arbitrary, and it depends what type of research you're doing. But we'll talk about that once we get to those research papers. And the activity we're picking up with EEG is a summation of a thousand, like thousands to millions of these things called pyramidal cells. And most of the activity we're picking up is actually um, the summations of postsynaptic potentials. So you, you might have heard of action potentials before. That's not what we're recording from EEG. Yeah, question. Yeah, so the question is, why do we need a reference electrode? You know, if you think about, if you think about what voltage is, it's a measure of, like, potential, essentially. And you, you can never, you know, if you take a voltmeter or an oscilloscope or something and you just put one probe on a, on a surface you're not going to get anything. There needs to be some signal that you're sort of referenced to. Well, I have a bunch of questions from that. Um, that, that I will pause it there. Yes? What cells are we studying? Cells? Uh, pyramidal. Pyramidal neurons. Yeah. Yes. So 
Let me get back to that. Was uh, back there? Was was that answer good enough for now? Okay, okay. I will I will post something on Piazza explaining voltage measurements in general because it's a little more like this isn't just true for EEG. Any voltage measurement requires this, you know, something you're measuring from and a reference. Um, so the ground electrode, because the ground electrode's purpose is to ground the participant, it needs to be plugged into the same recording equipment as the other electrodes. Um, in this case, the filters and amplifier is put into one thing. It should really be two different boxes. So the amplifier is what's taking these signals from the scalp, which are really, really small, right? We're measuring in the order of microvolts. And it amplifies it into something that is perceptible, something that we can actually see. And in this case, in modern amplifiers, it's amplifying into something that a digitizer can then read and turn it into a discrete signal that our computers can, can understand. Um, so the digitization is essentially taking this continuous analog signal and it's doing analog to digital conversion and turning it into a series of discrete stepped data that we can, you know, read into a machine, save on a file, whatever. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Is is a question why do we need a ground electrode? Uh, uh. You're saying why does it need to be connected to the amplifier in, in particular? I think in theory, theoretically, if if uh, if your participant is fully grounded, and you, and your amplifier and the room you're in is also fully grounded, there should be no problems. But a lot of the times when you're recording from these amplifiers, they're connected to batteries, so they're not actually connected to ground. And you want the common ground that the amplifier is operating on to be the same thing that the participant is grounded to. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I guess I didn't want to get super bogged down into the details, but most of the time with amps we are recording from a battery because we don't want, there's a lot of artifacts with EEG and one of them is line noise, which is the 60 hertz here, at least it's 60 hertz noise that's running through everything. And if our amplifier is plugged into a battery, there's a high chance that we're going to get that 60 hertz interference across all of our electrodes. And so instead we use a battery which is a direct current, right, rather than an alternating current, which is what we're recording. Um, and what our line noise is, we use just a nice direct current, steady, usually 12 volts, all the way down to 1.5 volts, depending on your amplifier. Um, so yeah, typically we're battery powered with these. It's also more safe for the participant, um, because if something goes wrong and something short circuits, you don't want to send 60 hertz AC into their scalp. Uh, but a little 12 volt DC shock is going to do a little less damage. Um, although obviously we try to design around that. Um, so yeah, here's, a, here's another image of sort of the cross-section of what we're, what we're recording from EEG. So up here we have our electrode, and this is something that I, I say a lot, but it's a good way of visualizing what I talk about when I say all of these layers that the electrode is on top of. So we have the scalp, the skull, the dura mater, the pia mater, all of this, and then way down there we have, again, thousands to millions of pyramidal neurons that have axons that are parallel and are not interfering with each other so that their signals, their postsynaptic potentials can sum up and we can record them. Um, so what we're getting from EEG, as figure B sort of shows, is if you were to magically record from each of these neurons, you'd be getting some response like this. But EEG is a summation of this postsynaptic potential. Um, so it's, when you know, when people are, we're so far removed from single <laughs> neurons with EEG. We're really recording from everything. Um, and again, it's, it's a very s small subset of, electro or of neurons that we're able to probe. So these are cortical neurons, and again, mostly pyramidal neurons that are parallel to each other. Not to say that that's the only thing we're recording from, or that other neurons aren't interfering with the signals that we're getting. Um, but this is most of what the signal we get is. Um, and I have a little bit of history, I'll, I'll do this pretty quickly, but uh, the first person to record EEG was our, our boy Vladimir over here, and he recorded it in, in dogs, and then Hans Berger is famously known as sort of the father of EEG. He was the first one to record it in humans, 
And actually, he did a lot of recordings from his, his own son, which I think is cool. There's a really good paper that I can post on Canvas that talks about the history of EEG, and it's really good. Recommend it. Um, so this is from his first publication. And this is actually him recording from his son, Klaus, right here. And each of, so there, there's two traces. The top one is the actual EEG, and the second one is a 10 hertz timing signal so that he knows how much time has passed. Um, and right here we can see that, you know, if we take this one section right here, I have 10 different oscillations of 10 hertz, which means that this is one second of data, right? If I have a signal that's changing one time, 10, you know, 10 times a second, and I keep 10 of them, then I know that this is one second. And if we look at the EEG data, and we also count them, we're seeing about 10 peaks. And so this is a very, very famous and probably the easiest thing to record in EEG. This is what's known as an alpha oscillation. Um, so you see these pretty much without trying. If you put a single electrode on the back of somebody's head, uh, on the occipital, and you have them close their eyes and relax, you're going to see a super strong alpha. It's, I mean, I don't think I've ever not seen an alpha in somebody. It's, it's so reliable. Um, and there are a bunch of different oscillations. Alpha and beta, which is the second wave that Hans Berger saw, were actually named by Hans Berger. But there are a bunch of other ones. And there, these bins, so let me, let me say these bins are not necessarily robust. So like there are researchers who disagree on where these bounds should be. And there are researchers that disagree on what any of these even are. If you want to talk about that, talk to Ina and Q. Um, because the Voitech lab is a neural oscillation lab. And they have a pretty fresh take on what neural oscillations actually are. Um, but this is sort of what the traditional concept of oscillations are. So you have ver these very discrete frequency bins where you know delta 0 to 4, theta 4 to 7, alpha 8 to 12, so on and so forth. And people will break up gamma usually into low and high gamma, whatever. There are other oscillations that are much faster. So I know that there's like a, a 4 kilohertz brainstem oscillation and stuff. But they're usually related to different activities. I'm not going to go over all of them. The slides will be uploaded so you, you, you can look at them yourself. Um, but the most popularly recorded thing is alpha. It is so unbelievably easy to record. And if you're going to be doing a project, I highly recommend looking for alpha above everything else just to make sure that your system is working and not picking up noise. Um, and then we'll talk a lot about these throughout the rest of the course, but I'm just seeding them here. Event-related brain potentials, which is something that I study. So different potential, essentially an ERP is EEG activity synchronized to an event. That's what the event-related portion is. So if you have certain things that are happening, in this case you have events X and O, let's say that it's a, you know, you're seeing a picture of a dog versus a picture of a cat or something. If you synchronize the activity from the onset of those stimuli and you average them together, for example, you can see this really clear trend. So we have different components, as we call them. Again, I'm going really fast over this because we will go into detail later. Um, but the event-related potential is essentially this synchronized activity. And the reason why we see the averages is because the single trials are pretty messy. But as you add more and more uh, trials, the signal becomes clear. So this GIF I made with my actual, some actual data I had uh, sort of showcases that. So the signal gets more and more smooth until we get this, this averaging trend. OK. Um, so that's where we're going to end with the slides, and I'm going to go over a little bit of logistics. Or I guess I'm going to do a little live coding. So how many of you have used Jupyter Hub before? Just normal Jupyter Hub. Okay. So if you if you just Google Jupyter Hub UCSD or just go to the URL if you know it, I just always Google it. Um, you'll get to this interface and. You're not going to be able to see the environment yet, but I do want to just show you what we have access to. Um, so you'll have to log in, of course. And the Wi-Fi is really, really slow today. It's just painful. Oh, there's Ethernet. All right, I'm not going to deal with it now, but we will no longer have slow internet after today. All right, maybe I'll deal with it right now.
Okay. Hopefully this works. It hasn't set. Oh, I might have to get my computer approved to be in the, the wired network. All right. It loaded with Wi Fi. So you're going to see, I think even if you're in multiple classes, you're going to see multiple different environments. I don't know what ours is going to be called, but the main feature that it's going to have is something called SOS, which is script of script, which I talked about on our first day in class. And you'll just launch that environment. And there are a couple of interesting things. So the ETS people were actually really excited to help me out with this because they've been wanting an excuse to set up all this crazy MATLAB functionality and stuff. And so now we have that. I'll, I'll show you that. Um, so for those of you who have used MATLAB, you've probably used it downloaded on a computer. Maybe some of you have used it math, MATLAB Online, which MathWorks has. We now have access to our own MATLAB Online through JupyterHub, um, which is pretty interesting if you're trying to do a, your own MATLAB stuff. This is going to take so long. Wi-Fi, please. I should have loaded this before, to be fair. On my machine, it takes like, it's instantaneous, so. <laughs> All right. Come on, you're almost there. Come on. Come on. Anyway, like I said, if Jupyter Hub ever has any problems, I'll. Uh, <laughs> I'll ex extend things. But, so most of you are used to, you know, creating new notebooks, whatever like this. You'll see in the kernel that we have a bunch of different things. Most of our notebooks are going to be SOS. But what I wanted to show you first is this MATLAB environment. So if you go all the way down and you don't create a MATLAB notebook, but you just create a MATLAB, it'll actually open up an instance of the online MATLAB thing. It says it's going to take several minutes, and I believe it. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to move over. Um, I don't know if I actually did anything in this notebook. All right, cool, perfect. Um, so when we're in here, we're, this is going to be a slightly different interface than you're used to, uh, just because typically these individual kernels or cells don't have the ab ability to choose a language, but that's what SOS is all about. Um, you, can control, you can just close that. I never use that. Um, so within SOS, you can actually write Python in the SOS kernel. So I could do x equals, you know, one, two, three, and print x. And it's going to work just like Python. The for loops will work as well. I range. I hate this keyboard so much. And we were to just, come on. So this is just regular Python. We also have Python 3 just by itself, which is not SOS, which is what I make the assignments with because I want SOS. I don't know, I, I, like the, I like the yellow Python 3 border that it has. It makes it more clear that you're doing it in, in Python. Um, and that, that warning is just something that happens. Don't worry about it. And we can do the same thing in MATLAB. So we have, we can just change our kernel to MATLAB. And we could, you know, do x equals 1, 2, 3. And for those of you who have used MATLAB, you know that when I execute this, it's actually going to print out the contents of x because I didn't terminate it with a semicolon. Also, and this is good because I forgot, when you run a MATLAB cell for the first time, it's going to take a while because it has to spawn up the MATLAB environment. Um, I think it was slightly faster this time because I already have this up. I'll go back to that in a sec. But yeah. So when you execute this line and without a semicolon, it's going to print out the contents. If you don't want to see the contents, put a semicolon at the end of it. Um, pretty self-explanatory. In the first assignment, I'll go, I have some basic walkthroughs of how to do different loops and logic and stuff in MATLAB. But well, that's the basic, the basic environment. So let me call this data something else. Let me call it data1. So I create data1 in MATLAB. And now I want to you know, do something with it in Python. So I change my language to regular Python 3. And I use a magic. So for those of you who have used Jupyter before, you've probably used different magics. Um, you just do the percent sign, get. And then you say the data that you want. So in this case, I want data 1. And then dash dash from and the kernel you want it from. 
So in this case, I'm saying get data one from MATLAB. And then if I am to, you know, if I want to see it, I can just print data one. And we can see that we were able to get data one from MATLAB. Now, if you want to get multiple variables in a single call, so let's say I have, um, let's put a number there. Let's say I want to get two variables at the same time. You just, you just do space and the other one. So you don't do data one, comma, data two. You just do data one, data two. Cool. Um, and then it works both, it works bidirectionally. So I can do, you know, data three equals. It's so weird using this keyboard. And then we go into, into MATLAB. And the magics are bidirectional. Um, Python 3, disp, data 3. Cool. So that's basically how you work with, with uh, SOS notebooks. And then this is cool. This is just MATLAB, but online. And as you can see here, we have access to the same files. Um, and this is really useful because if you're using EEG Lab, which we will be using, and you want to use it for the project, um, you can actually get the GUI working right here, so you can execute it. Actually, I have it's in the path, so this should. Uh oh. Oh, Jupiter Hub. Anyway, this works most of the time. I haven't had it not work, uh, but I know that. So the reason why things are being weird right now is because of licensing issues. Um, so we're gonna. We're going to deal with those, hopefully. OK, I have a question from Shrini. Does the magic permanently shift it into the new kernel? Yes, that's a good question. So we can test that right here. So I just got data 3 from Python 3. And now I can set a MATLAB kernel again to Python 3. And I can print out data 3, which I have set and moved to MATLAB. And we still have it. So what's happening under the hood is that SOS is coordinating the, the shared objects but they're not actually being transferred. Um, cool, so we'll end there. Uh